Well, I'm going to talk uh, about uh, search behavior in a model organism. And uh, we all know that movement ecology, new movement ecology has raised due to, to the new and massive data and new technologies that have uh, providing us with new ways of viewing uh, what essentially are all questions, okay, which uh, the questions as, as Ran uh, mentioned in his keynote, uh, talk are about why, when, and how animals move. These are very old questions, very generic questions. Uh, so, so the problem essentially is that I think we have not been able really to solve these questions. But potentially it's because we didn't have the data uh, or not. I mean, that's something that we can question ourselves. But movement ecology is about an understanding, of course, the interaction of uh, organisms with the environment and trying to get uh, how this interaction is came up with some motor output, with some trajectory, with some motor properties, and we can always think on 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 move on organism as as, as modular, right? Uh, as uh, elements that have components, uh, also like taken from from Rand uh, keynote uh, talk, uh, elements that can be on an internal system, can be a sensory system and be a genetic system. This is a simplification of one of those diagrams that uh, we all know from movement ecology special issue uh, at PNAS. But uh, this is a simplified scheme where we have an external input, which is the environment, could be conspecifics, could be other species, could be the landscape itself. Uh, this input enters in the system, uh, and then this system generates a motor output, right? So this is what we are trying to understand as behavioral ecologies, as movement ecologies, as biologists in general. So one of these old questions that I have, I think that they have not been well solved is the question of, of search, of search behavior. So what is exactly search? Here I have an example of two copepodes, with little tiny crustaceans that live uh, floating, randomly drifting or not so randomly drifting in the sea. This is a real data for uh, a male and a female. This is not a prey predator relationship. This is a mating relationship. Uh, and I'm really interested, or we are really interested, in, in this part of the trajectory. So when the male is li really looking for a signal uh, about anything, could be food, could be a female in this case, could be whatever. As you can see, of course, when, when the male gets this track of pheromone that the female is living, the, the change of behavior is tremendous. The male accelerates, the trajectory goes ballistic, and everything changes. So this would be a mode, right? This would be the mode where I'm, I'm doing taxis. I'm, I'm following a pheromone track until chasing the female. And this could be another mode, which is the search mode. So, what I'm going to try to talk today is about this search mode, okay? This part of the movement where we are assuming that there's a lack of information, okay? Some degree of information uh, we might have, but it's not full information. Another of my objectives in this talk is to cast a bit of doubt on these diagrams, on these drawings that we're seeing that we all have as biologists uh, kernelized in our minds. Okay, these are recent papers, 2008 ecology letters, uh, a review and synthesis uh, work. This is Benjamin Moore's 2014 ecology letters, news and perspectives work. So these are uh, classic views of uh, movement behavior, where we think that movement is essentially, uh, changes of behavior are essentially triggered by the landscape. And we have this patch and interpatch sort of uh, periods of motion. Uh, but uh, of course, here what I'm what I'm trying to tell you here is that within this patch movement, uh, there could be the search behavior that I'm looking for. So the assumption or the th the way we think on search essentially is that when animals don't have information, uh, they should just go straight to look for another patch. Either this, or either we should understand that this animal knows exactly where is this patch and just hits this patch 
either because it has memory, or because it has a special memory, or either because, I don't know, it can see that patch. But this is not a search problem, okay? If I'm fully memory, mem I can m fully memorize all, all my resources, I would just go one through M, and uh, this is not a search problem, okay? I'm fully informed, I know where are the patches, I'm just gonna have to solve which is the closest patch that I have around and then go there. Okay, this is not a search problem. Also interesting is this drawing here where um, uh, she and colleagues make the draw, they talk about this high restricted search behavior within the patch, then they say, okay, there's a patch departure mechanism here, and then there's a patch immigration, and on the track between the two patches, they write taxis. Taxis again means that the animal is fully informed about where is this patch. So this patch is releasing some kind of cue, which it generates a gradient, and that animal can follow that gradient until getting the next patch, okay? There's another reason for these people to draw straight lines between these patch uh, areas. And it's a reason that is based on search theory, because previous search theory was assuming that the best thing an animal can do when it doesn't have information is go ballistic. Okay, I mean, I don't know what, what, what Benham was, was trying to think about uh, when he was linking these patches uh, like that. But this is, you know, this guy has very, is very, is very, is very lucky if we are thinking that this is assumed to be a ballistic trajectory hitting, hitting, the, hitting the patch, right? So either because the theory that we were having in mind was saying that the best thing an animal can do is to search linearly when we don't have information. Either because we are assuming that animals are fully informed because they have memory or they go from one patch to the other because they know everything about the environment, or either because we're assuming there's always taxis that guides the animals towards one and the next patch, we always have this thing in mind of a straight line between two patches. Okay, so my interest is what happens when this External input is not there, mainly when we are in interpatch motion, okay? Of course, if the, if the sensory system is not detecting anything, animals have other skills, right? Of memory, associative learning, to try to, to move in the right way to the right place. But another thing that I'm gonna put here in the talk is this idea of that, you know, beyond this, there might be also a hidden motor program, a system that would allow the animal to look for things when this is not working and when this is not working or this is useless, okay? Of course, spatial memory, cognitive uh, processes, sensory processes are all good, are all in animals. So one thing doesn't take the other. My question has nothing to do with uh, getting rid of this. This exists. My question is, although this exists, is still there some potential for a movement repertoire that is not really driven by any of these things, okay? Well, from, from search theory, we have learned now some interesting new thing, which is that the ballistic strategy that we were all thinking about is only one of the potential solutions of a search problem. So if the targets that I'm looking for which I don't know where they are. It happened to be far away. The best strategy is to leave my area and go to reach these faraway areas. Okay, so go ballistic. That's the traditional way of thinking on search. But there's this new theory about Levy search theory, which essentially what uh, shows is that if we have nearby and faraway targets around, ballistic is not the best strategy to go. You need another strategy. You need a strategy that compensates or that generates uh, intensive and extensive search. So when we explore an area and we are assuming that maybe the things that we're looking for are nearby or far away, we'll have to get a compromise between local searching and ballistic movement, okay? So this theory, what shows, it's pure theory, random walk theory, that you need at least three ingredients to be able to balance adequately these intensive, extensive search modes. You need directional correlation, 
You cannot change your directions at any time. You need some persistence in your motion. You need, and this is very important, multi-scale or fractal reorientation times. Now, this theory can be relaxed. You don't really need pure fractal reorientation times. You just need multi-scale reorientation times or displacement. So I need to walk around and change direction in a very complex way, introducing multi, multiple scales and multiple displacements. In such a way, I break my characteristic scale of movement and I get these local and extensive search modes in an appropriate spatial distribution such that I increase a lot the probabilities to find both nearby and faraway targets. And this thing here generates something which is called superdiffusion. Okay? So you need these three properties, and that comes from theory, to search when you don't have information. OK, so is there any evidence of this in any animal? So there are some people that uh, are studying these things from another perspective, which is not movement ecology. But these are works that I like very much, because they show uh, that some of these ideas could make sense. Right? There's people working on, on E. coli, which have uh, analyzed, for example, uh, genes. And they have uh, detected that in E. coli, at least, motility may have evolved before taxis. So the genes that were uh, uh, related to the motor systems of E. coli, which is this uh, flagellar apparatus, are preserved genes, ancient genes, that are common to all bacteria. Indeed, this is for all bacteria. And uh, these are very different from the gen genes that are related to all the sensory ecology of the bacteria. This is telling us that the motor systems and the sensory systems, uh, evolutionarily speaking, could be decoupled at some point. And later on, those were coupled. Okay? So why an animal need a motor system? Was first the motor system or the sensory system? Motor systems were generated to search, to look for things, to find things, to get rid from places that I don't want to go. Okay? So these basic elementary things. Then it came up sensory ecology, you know, like fine-tuning, getting better ideas of where, what is the environment and what the environment can tell to me. OK. Uh, some of, some of uh, the works uh, of these people show that even based on, on, on metabolic, uh, metabolic uh, models, because in, in bacteria it's very well known how the metabolism is connected to the motor properties of the, of the cell. So they can, they can just playing with the, with the status of the internal state of the bacteria, they can generate these sort of complex properties of motion. Okay? And of course, there are some evidences also of, of these properties of motion in the, in the flagellar uh, apparatus. There's also people studying these things in Drosophila. So it's not that uh, I'm alone in this field. Okay? I've been studying this last years in several model organisms, like locusts, uh, ants, mussels, and, and, and also snails with collaborators, with empirical uh, people. Uh, because uh, you know, in control laboratory conditions, it's much easier to, to untangle what, what, is informa what is the information use that animals are doing. Of course, in wildlife, it's very complicated. But today, I'm going to talk about uh, C. elegans, which is one of the modular organisms that I'm uh, working with, is a free-living transparent nematode. It eats bacteria. It's one of the first animals that was genotyped uh, entirely. But also interesting is that it's, one of the it's the first animal, indeed, where there's all the neurons. Uh, it has 302 neurons. All the ne neuronal system is mapped, meaning that they know each neuron to what other neurons are is connected. They have already the map of the neuronal systems uh, of this animal. Yeah. Recently was sent out to space. So there's tremendous amount of uh, work done on this bug, on diseases, Alzheimer, pain, anything you can imagine, C. elegans is there. Not in movement ecology, not yet. So again, these ideas uh, of a system, which is a sensory system, something that is an internal state, a random motor program, an external input, a motor output, how, how all these three things are combined. 
Uh, but the nice thing of C elegance is that you can play with mutants. You can play with mutants that are sensory defective. So you know that that bug don't smell any chemical or cannot smell a chemical, specific chemical. Okay? We can also generate uh, internal state defective mutants, which you can control the insulin uh, status of the animal so that the animal doesn't have the feeling of starvation. So he can walk and walk and walk, but doesn't, doesn't feel like uh, he's starving. This is one of the things that you can do, but you can do many other things. You can do optogenetics, you can manipulate genes in vivo with light, turn off and turn on genes. You can do neuronal ablation, go and to a specific neuron and just block that neuron. Okay, so you can really play with them to connect behavior, mechanistic behavior with motor output. There's other interesting things of this animal, which is that the locomotion is very uh, special. And this animal crawls and makes make stereotype turns. This is very important to, to study this search theory, because the search theory is all about generating these multi-scale reorientations. So it's good to take an animal where these reorientations are visible, and I can identify them. Okay? So this animal, it's, this is well known since the 50s by naturalists generate these, these types of, of turns, essentially omegas, which is a strong bending of the body. Now you will see this is an omega. And reversals. Now this is another omega. Okay? And now the animal is going to crawl. So omegas is the strong bending. Reversals, the animal just crawl up, up, upwards and then stops and will crawl downwards. That's a reversal. And pirouettes is a combination of an omega and a reversal. Okay? So the animal only has three ways to make big turns, aside from crawling. And it happens that one of these ways, the pirouettes, is already a combination of two previous ones. So there's a lot of tinkering here. You know, the animal first generated these omega turns, then he got into the reversal, then he combined that and could generate pirouettes. Pirouettes are turns that generate 180 turns, essentially. So are very strong turns. And pirouette turning is very related to feeding to, to, to area-restricted search when there is food uh, in the area. OK. So what we have here is a tracking system. This is a Petri dish. We can track the animal. And we can also make pictures of the animal uh, at uh, whatever frame rate we want. This is cool because this is all behavior. So all behavior, the behavior that, that uh, we want to annotate from the trajectory comes from the images of the of the of the uh, of the nematode, right? So with these images, we can identify these stereotype turns and annotate them in the trajectory. Okay. So in the end, we we end up with things like that, which are etograms, where we can uh, these are 50 individuals. This is time, and these colors are the time spent in in, in one of uh, each of these behaviors. Okay? The grays are the crawling behavior. The cyan are the omega turns. The yellows are the pirouettes. Okay, here there's also pauses. The animal can also pause. And then if you take one of these lines here, you will get one of these trajectories. Okay? So one of the interesting things that we discover from this animal is that we know that it generates different types of turns. But what we didn't know in here we are uh, making a very simple uh, experiment where we put the animal. The animal is well fed in a Petri dish with bacteria. We just move it and put it in a new Petri dish. And we would just want to check what's the animal doing. Okay? Simple relocation experiment. Uh, from plenty of food, non-food, very environment, homogeneous conditions, etc. So what we saw is that some of these turning uh, rates were stable through time. Here it's a bit messy, but just know that there are some, some slopes that go down with time and some ones that are straight with time. Okay? Essentially, I'm going to talk about omegas and pirouette turns. So we discovered that omega turns are stationary through time, while pirouette turns were uh, non-stationary. Okay? So we, we start uh, with the animal on a plenty of food petri dish. We move it to no food, and after the next three 30 minutes, what we see is that a total decrease of the number of pirouettes 
and a stationary uh, rate for omegas. Okay? As I told you, pirouettes are related to aristic charge. These are, these are turns that generate really 180 turns. Okay? The animal is trying to get stick into the patch. Okay? This is aristic charge within the patch. But here there's no patch. What the animal is doing is trying to get stick in the area. Because you know, one second before, he was in a petri dish, plenty of bacteria. So his expectation, the expectation of the animal is that there should be food nearby. So he keeps on with the pirouettes. And only, you know, slowly, 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 you know, after 30 minutes, he switch off the pirouettes. Eh? And, 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 and well, basically, he's switching off the pirouettes over 30 minutes. So that's the memory of the animal. It's telling us that the animal is reluctant to change the behavior. He's trying to keep on, on the arrested search for 30 minutes. And slowly, he starts to decide that this is not the best he can do. But even more interesting is the fact that it ha we have this omega turning uh, on the background, which is stationary. Because this animal could just be doing pirouettes when there is food, and then switch to omegas when there is no food. No, the animal is combining the two types of turns simultaneously. And one is time dependent, memory dependent, if we want. Memory here understood as a physiological memory, okay, not a cognitive memory. And the other one seems to be independent. If we check the distribution of time intervals between these omega turns, we get uh, something that is, uh, a heavy, is a heavy tail distribution of time inter uh, events, which means that the inter events between these omega turns show this complexity that we were talking about, okay, between you know, having local small time inter events and from time to time have a rare time inter event, which is very long between one omega and the other. So these omegas by themselves would generate this template of sort of a random template, which more or less would optimize a non-informed strategy of search. On the top of that, the animal is putting these pirouettes. Okay? And that would be the memory part, the part that is more uh, um, uh, you know, dependent on, on the ex previous experience of the animal. So based on these ideas, we just took the data from, the, from C. elegans. We built up a model where essentially we, we put some patches in the landscape. And, and, and we play to, to take out and put in these sort of stereotype turns that we know uh, the animal plays with. So here we show the, this is search efficiency. This is a landscape. We compute search efficiency as the travel distance and the number of patches found. And here we imagine a, an nematode which cannot do any kind of turn, just crawling. So that will be the efficiency. We play here with the, with the correl correlation, the angular correlation of these crawls. So we can, of course, make more sinuous crawls or more straightforward crawls. So search efficiency increases, increases when, when we get more persistent direction. But it, if on the top of that, we add uh, these omega turns, these template turns, Okay, with the distribution that we saw, we see that the efficiency increases. If on the top of that, I add the pirouette turns, and here we add pirouettes when, whenever the animal has found some patch, we make the animal respond to that patch, adding the pirouette turns, of course, the efficiency improves. And if we, this is the last model, we combine omega, omegas and pirouettes, which is exactly what C. elegans does, we get better results. So this, this model is, uh, resonates with this other model uh, by Heino Matandi, uh, which is exactly the, doing this kind of uh, uh, models, where, where he's assuming a template of movement. And on the top of that template, he's adding, uh, in this case, uh, sensory uh, ecology or sensory information. Uh, in this paper, they were, they were playing with, uh, with different templates uh, of movement. So one of the templates uh, was, I'm going to, uh, well, we're using a distribution of displacements uh, based on the, so for every position that the particle or the animal was having, he would take the, the distribution of uh, minimum distances to the nearest uh, patches. Okay? That would be a, a possible template so that the animal doesn't know where are the patches, but no more or less the scale. So I'm going to pick a distribution of displacements that more or less resemble what, what um, what the 
well, more or less resemble the scales about uh, what the patches, where the patches are. And he gets this, uh, this, this is, um, it is not search efficiency, it means search time. So here, the higher, the worst, okay? The higher is the worst, the efficiency. So we, we do see that these levy properties, of course, improve the search efficiency. So if I, if I put a template with these complex properties, I'm going to get better. Of course, if I add sensory skills to the animal, so I'm going to be even, even better, right? So this is the kind of the results that uh, I was also expecting uh, from their model. So what we are doing now is improving the system, getting larger systems, getting larger uh, images, uh, larger, better images to define better or turning. This is, seems very trivial, but uh, it's complicated image processing. And uh, I'm going to show you now some results of what we are trying. We're trying to describe better all this complexity uh, that emerges from, from the motor uh, properties of C. elegans in bare environments. We are just using one of the clustering systems that uh, we have explained in the tutorial a few uh, hours ago. Uh, in this case, we are not using a speed and turn to define uh, behaviors. We are using other measures uh, like, uh, for example, like uh, well, we are getting uh, aggregate measures of, uh, that give us an idea of the spatial aggregation of, of, the, posi of the locations of the trajectory or uh, an idea of the resampling rates. You can make device many different local measurements uh, to describe the, that could serve to describe the complexity of the trajectory. Okay? Based on these, on these measurements, now we are even improving, we are using other measurements. We can get these clusters, which essentially uh, define us like the regions of ballistic movement, area restricted search, and we see two types of area restricted search, and then something that we call for A's, and you, you will see now in the trajectories. Okay? So this is a, an EMBC clustering uh, for one trajectory, and this would be the, the trajectory of uh, one individual. Again, the same, it was, it's the same experiment. From, from petri dishes with uh, plenty of bacteria, you move the animal, no bacteria there, nothing there, what the animal does. The animal starts doing this, you know, iris the church movement, okay? Uh, there are pirouettes here, of course, these pirouettes that I was talking to you about are there, but we can here identify like these sort of structures uh, in, a ma in a more defined wa uh, way. So we have these blue ones are like very localized clusters. Then we have greens, which are more open clusters. Then we have these forays things, these loopy things. And then we have the ballistic part. Okay? So it's just a better definition of what we were uh, uh, trying to look at. Okay? Again, other trajectories here, uh, another trajectory here, no ballistic uh, re regimes or regions. These are foray things, then the, the greens here, like, like more expanded clusters, the blues, more concentrated clusters, okay? All this has, uh, is, is like inherent to the animal. There's nothing in that environment that tells us that the animal is getting anything uh, uh, that could respond to this thing or to this thing there, okay? Now we can connect these spatial structures to the specific orientations that the animal does. So if we take omega and pirouette turns, uh, we can see for each, the, each color is one of the clusters. So this would be the, the ballistic regime. This is I restricted search one, I restricted search two, these are the four H's. So we can see that for the omega turns, they are, you know, this is the cumulative distributions of, of the omega turns. There's, there's no significant difference. So omega turns are equally present in all these clusters, spatial clusters that we have observed. Pirouette, uh, pirouettes are not. Pirouettes are only existing on, on, with more frequency on the blue clusters, which are these very intense clusters. These clusters are driven by pirouettes. Okay? Then the, the green clusters also are also driven by pirouettes, and so on and so forth. And the, in the ballistic, there are almost no pir pirouettes. So you can see here that all the cumulative distributions here are overlapped, and here we see clearly a gradient. So pirouettes are more often seen in the blues than in the greens, then in the yellows, and then much less in the ballistic. Okay? So we can connect, the idea is to connect these stereotype turns and see what structures in the, in the trajectory are generating by changing, by switching these rates, et cetera, et cetera. So this is the whole picture. 
So the picture is this is this is the let's say the 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 temporal uh, this is time and this is the proportion of the different spatial clusters over the population of nematodes that we have checked. So this is population level. Essentially, what we can see is here that the animals start with very uh, clustered search, which is the blue color, the RST that search cluster one, and combined with the green one. And then as time goes by, the ballistic emerges. This is what you can see here, OK? But can we explain why, why, why all this? I mean, is this different modes? Or is this a part of a single mode, which is a search mode? I mean, that's the question. So we should consider this a different mode or not? Of course, the first phase, for me, for us, people who are studying this now, we are totally connecting this first phase to the memory of the previous uh, you know, status of the animal. Okay? So this is a memory-driven uh, behavior. The animal tries to look for, look for, and he's not, a, he's not really convinced, so he's going to insist that. That's, remember, that's, the, that's the, first, the first 30 minutes. Uh, so this memory for C. elegans lasts 30 minutes. After that, this is a two-hour trajectory. After that, it comes this phase where the animal is sort of combining like these straight moves with more extensive uh, motion here. This is one of the examples. We, we have more examples with better extensive, intensive sort of uh, compromises. And then we have another phase where the animal seems to have decided that the best thing is to leave the area. But leaving is not searching, OK? Search for us is this regime here, where memory has gone. The animal is doing something that is more complex than we would have expect. And then lately, once the animal has sampled the area, has de decided that, look, the best thing is to live, live, and live, then he will go to the ballistic. So from my perspective, we should really revisit this thing. Because the, the things that are going on in between patches can be much more complex than what we a priori always assume. And that's it. Essentially, I'm trying to link search and foraging as two separate things, but of course, link ones together. And you know, foraging has always been based in the exploration, exploitation, foraging trade-off. In search theory, we're now talking more about the extensive, intensive search trade-off, which is different. One thing is exploiting or exploring. And the idea is, OK, once you're on the exploring phase, we are now really concerned about how animals deal with this intensive, extensive trade-off. In foraging theory, we always think on taxis or ballistic motion as interpatch motion. In search theory, we think on interpatch motion as a search behavior. Okay? And from theory, we know that search behavior should entangle complex movement, multi-scale motor properties. We think on foraging theory, classic foraging thing, are restricted search as a perception reaction. So you, you talk to many people and say, yeah, are restricted search. When the animal sees a cue in the environment, he will perform are restricted search. What the search theory is telling us is that there could be also are restricted search inherent as a part of a search strategy. Okay? One, one, one thing here is, is this animal being efficient? Uh, here, for example, well, even here, I mean, he's not efficient, right? He has the memory that there was food, but this is the best he can do, okay? Because uh, he's really thinking that, okay, I, I, there were bacteria nearby, so that's the best I can do. But, you know, animals can get stick making a cluster of search in a bare, envi in a, in a bare environment, and this is not efficient. But the animal doesn't know. This is the best the animal can do, according to the theory, uh, uh, of intensive extensive compromises, right? And finally, uh, well, this is a bit more sophisticated, but um, I won't, I won't, I won't go that <laughs> that thing. This is more like uh, whether there's, you know, if if this thing is for real, then we should start to think that natural selection could have also pushed or tuned stochastic systems, you know, probabilistic systems, not really deterministic solutions to problems, but probabilistic solutions to problems. Like, I have a problem, I have to find things. The solution to this problem must be probabilistic. So it's not about 
what specific route I'm going to take. It's about what the statistics of displacements of turns can allow me to enhance the probabilities to find things. And could it be that natural selection could also operate at that level, at the level of a distribution of time, time inter-event reorientations, or not? And that's, that's, that's one of the questions. And I'm done. <laughs> Any question? I think it was really enlightening. Okay, um, thank you. I think you pretty much nailed it in the sense what I think you guys didn't see, but most of the species that I'm catching are in South Korea. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's just really enlightening. The, the only problem is it's a nematode, it's not a bird, you know, yeah. or a mammal. I know, I know, but <laughs> it explains so much about why all these theories and everything doesn't fit. Yeah. Well, it's when you get into this, uh, people in systems biology studying these organisms uh, are, you know, there's, 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 there's not yet these links. You know? They are so focused, so precise into the genes and the connections of the genes to the proteins and the metabolism and then, you know, the sensory reactions. So are really, really, really on the detail of the things. And I think from, from, from an ecological point of view, we need much less than that to start to solve like very big questions. You know? So, yeah. So the question in my mind as you kind of talked about it from a lower perspective is that this perception is disappearing. So where does perception go? Perception does not disappear. For example, one, one of the good things we can do here is to get this sensory defective mutant. And then we will compare. What, is, what are the properties of this, these animals that I was showing to you? These animals are sensing. And compared to the sensory defective. But 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 search is a sensory. I mean, of course, there's always sensing. The the the, the, the difference is uh, in the accumulation of no response to those sensors. Like in the accumulation of no information, so no information is an information. Sure, so that's my point. All I'm saying is, it seems to me that transition mm -hmm. memory triggers the reverse transition. So the the transition from the aristide search. Exactly, when you get the sleep mode. Yeah, I don't know which. Pro I mean, yeah. some internal. It's it's an internal decision. Let's see. For example, if you put this sensory defective guy and he cannot do any of these shifts, that that answer your question. So that, that these are the kind of things that, of course, everything is there. You know? mm -hmm. No, you, you, they are there, and you need to have them. But my point is, if, if, if you block everything, there's a motor system yet. That's even a, a, a weird question, if you want. No? But, but the, the, the point is, uh, how much is the coupled, the motor system, to the sensors? No, that is, that's a big question. I don't know. But, but, uh, or if I, I totally deplete the sensors, is the motor system still doing something? I know. So in in your definition, search is only a search in the past. So that's I think that there is there needs to have a semantic. No, searching searching occurs out of patches. But all this was searching. You know, the memory when you said it's living in the past. Yeah. That term is being said leaving. It's it's leaving the area. Yeah. Yeah. It's leaving because it's searching. Yeah. I mean no no, I mean that 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 that's the question I was putting. I mean how we should consider all this. You know, is, is, is this a full search behavior repertoire? Uh, the whole process, like I'm going to stick to the memory first, then I'm going to try something else, which is sample, explore, 
And then I'm once I've sampled, I'm going to decide I should leave the area and then start all over. And I will leave the area with, with uh, some memory or without some memory to a new area, then sample that area, and then leaving. You know, it's difficult to put. I agree. I mean, uh, what, what I'm really interested in is in this, in this intermediate uh, phase, no? Like, like this thing here. Because for me here, the driver is leaving. It's not searching. It's not sampling, you know? Here, the assumption is that the animals try to sample to find in a, in a more complex way. Here, here is also trying to sample, but the driver is memory. Here is trying to sample. I don't know what's the driver. Here, the driver is I'm going to leave. So the searching and sampling is very different. Yeah, well, we can discuss. I mean, it's interesting. I, I mean, we need new semantics for these things. I, I, I don't know. I mean, it's. That's, that's the thing. I mean, think that all experiments in C. elegance, uh, all, and I think this is the first one, showing data for two hours. I mean, people for, since the 80s is looking at 30 minute tracks, which is the size of a petri dish. That's what you have. Then the animal would just hit the borders. And so I don't know. It would be great to have eight hours here. These animals can, can live, uh, with, can, uh, they are not starving. They can move for 24 hours without starving without seeing uh, strange behaviors on the animal. No? Uh, I don't know how long it will last that. <laughs> Whatever. I'm just curious, we always start to assume that animals should behave optimally. Since when do humans behave optimally? <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So for me, this is really fascinating. And why should we always put environmental constraints and observe of that assume that it should be optimal? Mm -hmm. So that's really neat. That's why I think. Yeah, the idea is that we're looking for for a sort of a default thing uh, when there are no these constraints. No? Yeah. If there is if there is a default thing, what is this? That, I mean, getting close to free will. You know. Is, is this free will uh, anywhere in, in terms of motor properties? And, and what should this free will look like? Uh, I don't know. There's many ways to view these things. Carl? So, so Nick, I want to I wanna understand this really. You said that in that last case, <laughs> if the animal is doing something willful or rude, which is something volition, you, you call it getting away. And getting away in a place where the animal knows exactly. that there's nothing there. Exactly. That's why it's getting away. Exactly. Yeah. It's just left in this place in yeah. Now it knows that it's yeah. not there, so it's probably one of these probably. Of course. Probably he's, he's collecting information. He's using information of all kinds. I'm not saying that the animals are not mm, processing information. There are sensors there. That's what I'm saying. There are sen he's accumulating information that there's nothing here, nothing there. But, the, but the, my point here is that, uh, there's there. my point here is that we, we tend to, to give a specific um, specific uh, motivations when we see a change of movement. Okay, uh, here maybe the motivation is the same. It's still the same. It's sampling, sampling. I'm still on the same mode. No, so that's the problem. I mean, when when we see a change of uh, of behavior in, uh, of uh, uh, of properties in a trajectory, uh, is is a change of mode or is the mode that is that complex and it will generate all all the whole repertoire in the trajectory. Okay. Okay. Cool. There's, 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 there's definitely things that go through time here on the animal. Definitely. Another thing that we can do is this sensor, these mutants that are state internal, knocked out. Let's say stable. That also will tell us what, what, what would be the drivers, sensors, the, the status. Imagine that we see, you know, something that is. We don't have that data yet, but. No, that's that's the idea, but I agree to you. I mean, there's information. Animals process information.
<laughs> I was blown away by how clever you were. So it strikes me that you're, the way you cast the area restricted search, I always think of that as a search where they haven't depleted the resources. Yet once they perceive that they depleted the resources, they start doing mm -hmm. broad scale search. Mm -hmm. So their pirouettes and search in here and once the resource is depleted with a little a little while they will start one little search mm -hmm. that they found something else. Perfect. No no that's that's another experiment that we have in mind. So we are starting with the basics, then we can put glucose patches or bacteria patches. Even we can this animal uh, associates temperature with uh, with food. So you can train uh, the animal to associate even temperature with, with bacteria, and then you can put temperature patches, which is you can really can be very precise on how this temperature is diffusing, and so you, we are thinking on all these things. But again, it's 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 very interesting. If we put a patch here in the middle, of course there will be a restricted search. Pirouettes will start to play for how long? Uh, you know, m more than that, more than the memory thing, it's going to last for, for how long? It's, it's, it's going to deplete it, and then how long it will keep on trying and trying, or it will just lift, uh, live uh, sooner than 30 minutes, you know, like, and how, you know, he will live more happy and maybe more ballistically, so he's not engaged into the search thing, so he was not forced to search because he's already fed. I don't know, there's many, many questions. No, no, you can follow on. Um, so I, when I observed um, species closing in the wild, and then they're looking at different species, but they very rarely will actually completely deplete mm -hmm. what, they're, what they're eating before they move on. You know, they'll divide it into a, you know, a super fat, and they're, they're essentially moving, but they don't necessarily deplete stuff. And it's in, in the, the migrants that move a lot. Mm -hmm. They can leave. They would really deplete it or, yeah. you know, not even dissociate it necessarily, but yeah. still move the food yeah, yeah. I mean, if you see, these are like classical foraging experiments, right? But in a new version of it, with a space and with an animal that you can manipulate. So that's what we are looking for. No. question. So I would I would not expect that 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 face, right? So we are we are now running experiments where we the animals are fed, then we we wait uh, 30 minutes, which is exactly so we can run hopefully we still the animal will start from this phase and maybe we can run a bit more uh, into here. You know? So as we cannot do 8 hours, we can Precondition the animals, no? And start this thing supposedly in this phase or in this phase or even in this phase and see what's up to the 24 hours. But this is gonna, these are never, you know, never endless. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway. But, okay. How consistent is the 30 minutes? Really consistent for the population. So when another interesting thing with these guys, these are clones. The elegans are basic clones, even clones than more than clones because they are all from the same lab, living in the same petri dish. So, so they are supposedly to be super similar, born in the same conditions, and you see a lot of behavioral plasticity and variability, which is one of the other questions that uh, strike uh, us and many other people, of course. But uh, but there are some things that uh, look consistent. They are, they are, uh, you know, like like you see here. No, so 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 there are patterns there. Okay, so so the ballistic regime 
you know, it grows and grows. So, so this is pretty stable, no? It's, it's not that noisy. But uh, definitely there's variation. There's some animals. You will never get an animal starting with a ballistic phase here. So this pattern is there. And if it's not 30 minutes, it would be 25 or 35, you know, but it's, it's pretty there. But, but uh, there's, there's a lot of, uh, as, as I was saying, this is, this, is an, this is a very bad example in this trajectory of this in intensive, extensive uh, period. No? There are other animals that perform that much better. There are other animals that, you know, concentrate, would concentrate more this area restricted search initial phase. This animal is doing all this looping here and drifting. So there's this kind of variability. But Could be. But it turns back on, and so the animal sort of responds to that. Yeah, sure. There are, there are important internal state scales that will trigger this decision making. But I think that for each animal, so I've worked also with locus. We're doing similar experiments as this one with locus. And the, the memory of food was lasting like uh, almost six hours. So we were doing the same experiment, putting the locus with uh, food, then moving them, and see these properties. Uh, and they were trying to do this area restricted search thing for the first six hours. And then after that, they were starting to enter into that phase. So I, I, I'm not showing here this work, but I already have played with these ideas with other, one of, other model organisms. And, and I, I don't know why these scales are, are, are different, you know? Well, that's scary. No, oh, this is very subjective. That's my personal opinion. Eh? Uh, I would expect this guy to turn into the uh, search, what I call this pure search omega phase. Yeah, until finding something. So like he goes, really leaves the area and starts to explore another area. And of course, if he finds something, he will get into the area of the search. But when we put a patch, we will see also the effect of once I'm in a patch and I depart the patch, what is going to be the reaction? But I, that's what I would expect. Ballistic, ex, uh, extensive intensive compromise, ballistic, extensive. Yeah. 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 So just one, one single thing, so, so we have a motor system, which is not cognitive, it's autonomous, which is our eyes. So if I ask you to watch a picture and detect the woman with the red uh, hat, and there's, you search like that. Your eyes go and, and locally search, move around, locally search in a stochastic manner. So you're trying to compromise this intensive, extensive search. Of, if I give you the, the key, Note that you have one minute to look for that red hat. So if you have a snapshot of a picture and someone asks you, your eyes are going to do that. So this is another motor system built in a homo sapiens <laughs> human being which does that. Thanks. Thanks.